Hello, this is Pastor Jim Ponko with the Midweek Meditation for Wednesday, February 24th, 2020. And today I, I wanted to share with you the Word of God as it is found in John chapter 13, beginning in verse 21. After he said this, Jesus was troubled in spirit and testified, Very truly I tell you, one of you is going to betray me. His disciples stared at one another at a loss to know which of them he meant. One of them, the disciple whom Jesus loved, was reclining next to him. Simon Peter motioned to this disciple and said, Ask him which one he means. Leaning back against Jesus, he asked him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, It is the one to whom I will give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in the dish. Then, dipping the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas, son of Simon Iscariot. As soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered into him. So Jesus told him, What you are about to do, do quickly. But no one at the meal understood why Jesus said this to him. Since Judas had charge of the money, some thought Jesus was telling him to buy what was needed for the festival or to give something to the poor. As soon as Judas had taken the bread, he went out, and it was night. Sometimes people surprise us, and I don't mean in a good way. Have you ever had a friend you thought you could trust who turned on you? Did you ever have somebody who was like a member of a club that you were in, or a part of your church, or, or um, maybe the bus a business that you were in, and later you found out that that person had been stealing from you all, all along? Or maybe, maybe you discovered a spouse that had been unfaithful to you and you had no idea. Jesus is an, or excuse me, Judas is an example of somebody who was like that. Somebody who was going to betray Jesus. Someone who was misusing the trust of others and the people closest to him had no idea. That is except Jesus, because Jesus knows our hearts. Jesus told all of the disciples that one of them was going to betray him, and John says that they were at a loss to know which one of them he meant. And, and it gets even more ironic when we are told that um, Jesus told John that um, it was the one to whom I will give this piece of bread. That's the one who's going to betray you, me. And then Jesus gave the bread to Judas and told him to go, and John admits no one at the meal understood why Jesus had said this to him. You see, what was going on is that for these people it was unimaginable that Judas would do something like that. And yet he did. Today we're going to spend some time looking at Judas, looking at Judas's betraying hands. And we're not going to do that because it'll give us clues to be able to find other people who may be unfaithful to us, but rather because the story of Judas should leave us thinking. If Judas could be with Jesus 24 hours a day, seven days a week for almost three years and still fall away from his Savior, is it possible that there is something that could lead us away from our Lord as well? So we look at Jesus betraying hands, and we notice how his hands are in the money bag. We notice how his hands receive that bread from Jesus. We notice how God uses Judas' betraying hands for his own purposes. Now, based on what I just read from the Gospel of John, you might think that Judas' decision to go and betray Jesus was, was a spur-of-the-moment kind of thing. But when you read the rest of John and the rest of the Gospels, you realize that John, Judas's life was a slow, downward spiral into his soul's destruction and control by sin. Judas started out as someone handpicked by Jesus, um, somebody who watched and learned at Jesus' feet, 
someone who was sent out by Jesus as an evangelist, who by the disciples was even given the honor and the special responsibility of being treasurer to the group. I think that's an important thing for those of us who might be considered pillars in our congregation, those of us who are lifetime Christians, those of us who are leaders in our church, and those of us who are workers in the church too, pastors and other called workers. Why? Well, remember what the Apostle Paul said to the Christians in Corinth. He said, so if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you do not fall. What ultimately caused Judas's fall began with one sin. The sin was greed. Judas loved money. Not like Scrooge McDuck, you know, laying it and throwing it over his head. No, what Judas loved is he loved the freedom and the security and the control it gave him. Judas loved money, but he didn't want anybody else to know how much he loved it. He usually kept it hidden, although there was one occasion when he let it slip. About a week before these events are described, um, Mary had come to Jesus and anointed him with a pricey bottle of perfume. And Judas had spoken up. He had said, why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It sounds like maybe Judas was just, well, you know, grumbling about a waste of money. But John notes, he did not say this because he cared for, about the poor, but because he was a thief. And as keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put in it. Do you see how money or how, how sin can take over? It starts, simply enough, it starts when we love a blessing that God gives, but we love it a little bit more than we should. Judas appreciated money and what money could do. And Satan saw this as a, as a crack, as an opening through which he could enter. Satan pointed at that bag of money that it was Judas's job to carry and said, you have more use for that money than, than those disciples. No one will notice if you just take a little. And besides, this is an extra responsibility. You should be paid for what you are doing. And so, apparently, Judas started helping himself. And after a while, stealing from the money bag, bag was the new normal in his life. And he was thinking about money more and more. Thinking about how he could ensure his own security if this Jesus thing didn't work out. In reality, Judas now had a new God. He didn't trust the God who was standing right in front of him. He didn't trust the God who had already shown him so much love and was teaching him the way and had come to save him from his sins. He didn't trust that God to take care of him. No, he trusted money. And then it came to his mind that there was a way that he could get his hands on the equivalent of a several thousand dollars and all he would have to do is help out the Jewish religious leaders a little bit. And that was an opportunity he couldn't pass up. You know, Judas is one of the reasons that the season of Lent is always a season of repentance, a time when we examine our own hearts for idols. Are there any idols in your heart like there were in Judas's heart? Maybe your idol is a little bit like Judas's. Maybe your idol is money. And your regular trips to pick up lottery tickets, your occasional trips to the casino are really just uh, more scenes in that love affair that you're having with the thing that you have decided really makes you happy, happier than God makes you. Or maybe your politics are your God. And you believe that your future can only be secure if the right leaders are in charge. 
And as a result, you spend hundreds of hours during a week or two listening to what those potential leaders are saying and only one hour a week listening to what God has to say. Has something else taken God's place in your heart? You need to learn from Judas. Because when Judas tried to lead, when Jesus tried to lead Judas to repentance, Judas wouldn't even listen to the pleas of the Son of God. Now, Ju Jesus had all along warned his disciples that he knew that someone of them was going to betray him. And, and on that night, he, before Judas betrayed him, he had really begun to focus directly on Judas. But what's interesting to note is that Jesus' efforts are not in anger, but in love. Remember, Jesus washed all of the disciples' feet that Thursday night, and that includes Judas' feet. And if you read John's account of what happened that night, it appears that Judas was given a place of honor at the table for the Passover meal, a place right next to Jesus, because Jesus was able to just turn and give him a piece of bread. And by the way, that giving of a piece of bread was also an honor in a feast like the Passover meal. But of course, that bread had additional significance. Remember I told you earlier that John had asked who was going to betray him, and Jesus had said, it is the one to whom I will give this piece of bread. But what I didn't mention is that Jesus had been talking about bread a little bit earlier, before that even, uh, several minutes earlier during the feast. He had talked about the fact that that the betrayal of Jesus was something that had already been prophesied by King David in the Psalms. And he quoted Psalm 41, verse 9, where David says, Even my close friend, someone I trusted, who shared my bread, has turned against me. So, He's using all of that, the word and the promises and, and, and the prophecies to lead Judas to repentance. In a very real sense, Jesus is doing exactly what he told all of us to do, which is, if your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. Jesus is talking one-on-one -on -one with Judas to lead him to repentance, but Judas doesn't listen. Why? Well, John notes, as soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered into him. Now, this does not necessarily mean that Judas was demon-possessed at that point. Judas appears to still be in control of his choices and of his actions. What it seems to be saying is from this point on, Judas chose to follow Satan rather than to follow Jesus. In the past, Judas had been following Satan's suggestions, right? Believing that money was a better God than, than the true God, that it was more important than God's love. But now Judas had seen Jesus act out God's love. Show him God's love. Call him to repentance in love. And Judas decided that a fistful of coins was better than the eternal riches of God's kingdom. And because he made that choice, Satan was now his master, not Jesus. So John tells us that Jesus told him, what you are to do, do quickly. It almost sounds like Jesus is angry with Satan. As if Jesus is saying, or to, with, with Judas, as if Jesus is saying, so you're going to reject my friendship and my love? Go ahead. Dig your own grave. See if I care. But Jesus did care. The gentle, loving, and patient way that he had acted toward Judas shows that he cared. Jesus was genuinely troubled by what his friend was going to do. He cared about Judas. He cared about his eternal destiny as much as he cares about your soul and mine. But Judas had made a choice. He had set his mind to sin. 
And Jesus still had important work to do. And Judas's sinful choice was part of that important work. You see, the Father's saving plan had always included the fact that the Messiah's friend would betray him. It had to be that way. So when Jesus, when Judas left to betray Jesus, Jesus urged him on. Why? Because Jesus was about to be forsaken by a person far closer to him than one of his disciples. Remember how the very next day Jesus cried out from the cross, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? At that moment, Jesus was, uh, was suffering the emptiness of hell. He had been forsaken by his heavenly Father. He was enduring what our sins deserve. You know, at the beginning of this message, I asked you if anyone had ever turned on you and betrayed your trust. If that's ever happened to you, you know how painful, humiliating, and bewildering it can be. Jesus went through that, right? He went through that for us. He'd done nothing to deserve it, but he was betrayed by his friend. He was abandoned by his father. He experienced Judas's betrayal and God's abandonment because of us. Because you know that pain that we sometimes felt when we were betrayed and abandoned? Guess what? God has experienced it from us. He's experienced it from us when we turned our back on him and, and followed our favorite sins and pleasures and set up another God in our hearts and, and hurt the people that are around us. You see, Jesus was taking the punishment that we deserve in our place. He was being betrayed because we deserve to be betrayed. And so he chose the shameful, disloyal, selfish betrayal of Judas in order to save you and me. You know, sometimes people do surprise us, and, and not in a good way. But Jesus wasn't surprised at all by Judas' betrayal. In fact, he used Judas' betrayal as part of his saving work for us. And even though our sins may be a painful surprise to others, and we may set up for ourselves gods in our hearts, just like Judas did. Jesus has washed all of our betrayal away. Amen. Let's pray. Prince of Peace, because of the victory you won for us over sin, death, and hell, we now ask you to rule over us with your grace. Forgive all our sins and Fill us with every spiritual blessing. Grant that we may be devoted to you in our hearts and lives as you were devoted to the will of your Father. Help us conduct ourselves in a way that fits the fact that we are heirs of everlasting glory and, and keep us from being overwhelmed by the troubles of this life or falling prey to Satan or yielding to the desires of our own sinful nature. Grant us willingness to bear our crosses and, if necessary, to suffer for you as you so willingly suffered your cross for us. And in the name of Jesus, we pray the prayer he taught us, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.